So in a culture in an era of short attention spans and sound bites, it's sometimes hard to listen to a chapter of scripture like we just did. Uh, but I think it's important, especially as we're going through this Proverbs journey. Today is August 23rd. Keith read for us the 23rd Psalm, so we're going a Psalm a day. And uh, if you've not joined the journey, you can still jump on board. This last week, uh, today, Psalm uh, Proverbs 23, tomorrow, Proverbs 24. And uh, it's really good for us to hear just the, the full chapter of, of information and of life transformation. Well, there's a University of Maryland study that suggests that the average man speaks 7,000 words a day. What do you think the average woman speaks? To, uh, pretty close, 20,000. Yep, so almost uh, three times as much. Maybe that surprises you. Maybe not. But even if we speak as little as 7,000 words a day, dudes, that's still a lot. As we've been studying the book of Proverbs, one of the biggest themes is how we use our words. Uh, if we don't learn how to speak well, we won't live well. We won't be wise. We won't prosper. Today's teaching is going to focus around one verse, Proverbs 18, 21. It says this, the tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruits. The tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Throughout our series, we've seen the individual Proverbs actually have countless connections to other biblical places, to the storyline. When you double click or when you tap on a word with your finger, it's going to take you uh, to links underneath that direct you to other places. Have any of you ever instinctually tapped on your hard Bible? Uh, I've done that. You know, it just shows the machines are taking over. But Proverbs 18.21 is no standalone fortune cookie that you'd find at Panda Express. Uh, this is, in some ways, this one verse could summarize the entire biblical story. There are some weighty, well-connected words here. Think of these words, words like tongue, life, death, fruit, eat. Do any of these words ring some bells for us? Of course, they're going to take us many places, but first to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, we read that God makes and maintains the universe by speaking. God names the sky and sea, day and night. Uh, then there's Adam, made to reflect God who names the animals, and then later names his wife. Eve then names her children. Naming confers a, a value, an identity, a purpose. The tongue is the power of life. But then the mysterious serpent comes onto the scene. He speaks deceitfully. He says to the humans, did God really say not to eat the fruit? Humans doubt God's words and then disobey them. Afterwards, Adam speaks, but he's no longer naming, now he's blaming. He, he blames God and his wife in one sentence. Nice one, Adam. The wife speaks, blaming the serpent, every relationship now broken. Not long after, Cain speaks deceptively to his brother, lures him to the field and kills him. The tongue has the power of death. But God isn't done speaking life. You see, he shares another promise. One of Eve's de descendants will crush the serpent, representing evil, sin, and death. In the Gospel of John, we find out later that this descendant is called the Word, the speaking one. This Word becomes flesh, human. We know him as Jesus. And so there's a sense in which the whole biblical story surrounds itself, is centered around words, creation, fall, redemption. And in many ways, our own story revolves around words as well. So this morning, I want us to look at the power of words, the source of our words, and the renewal of our words. Power, source, renewal. So first, the power. You know what's fascinating? From a, number, from a limited number of English letters, 26, we can create an infinite amount of words and phrases and sentences. And like Adam and Eve, we can use them to name or to blame, to build up, or to tear down. As the Proverbs say, our words have the power of life. Proverbs 15, 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Tree of life, does that ring any bells? Sending us back to Genesis again to the garden. 
The tree represents endless, abundant life. And this phrase, tree of life, only occurs in three places in the Bible. Genesis, Proverbs, Revelation. Beginning, middle, and end. There's something about words that just might get us back to Eden. There's something about words that just might bring us back to God. Life-giving speech includes healing words. Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Words can remove burdens like bulging backpacks, taking the weight of worry off our hearts. Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Kind words are like medicine, medicine for our hearts, like aloe vera for a sunburn. Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are a honeycomb from Keith Anderson's bees, but they're sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 10, 21, the lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. Notice all the food comparisons, fruit and honey. Words are restorative, fulfilling, sweet, nourishing. And all of us have been there, struggling, broken down, and someone noticed and spoke restoration over our situation, spoke healing to our hearts. Are we aware of the great power that even our offhand words have to bless others? Well, life-giving speech also includes helpful words. Many of us might remember those light bulb moments where a teacher or a coach or a pastor said something and it really clicked. Or maybe it was a book you read years ago or a verse you read and you'll never forget it. I know Frank and I pray that, that we'd be that for you here, that we'd be people who only build up your, and feed your faith. Proverbs 16, 21, the wise in heart are called discerning and gracious words promote instruction. Proverbs 20, verse five, counsel in a person's heart is deep water, but a person of understanding draws it out. Have you noticed sometimes it's difficult to understand ourselves by ourselves? Our hearts, our motives, they're like deep swirling waters. But a person of understanding can help us discern ourselves, drawing out that wisdom. Counselors like my sister Nicole and like Tawny, life coaches like Maritza, or, or, or you know, even just good listeners. And of course, the word of God too, sharper than any two-edged sword, helps discern our motives. I'm positive that Paul has Proverbs on his mind as he pens Ephesians 4.29. Don't let any unwholesome talk, crumbling, corrosive, bitter, destructive talk, come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Only what's helpful, beneficial, intentional, encouragement. Faith, you're really good at that. Life-giving language also includes honest words. And these are not always immediately enjoyable. One biblical word for this is rebuke, correction. Proverbs 28, 23, whoever rebukes a person will in the end gain favor rather than one who has a flattering tongue. Or Proverbs 24, 26, an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. See, in the short run, honest words hurt. Uh, the rebuke is painful for both parties. But in the long run, the one rebuking may gain favor and the one being rebuked may feel loved. The metaphorical kiss on the lips. Weird image, I know, but although it's difficult, not having the hard conversation is often worse than avoiding it. Now we know correction and rebuke requires the most wisdom because it can go wrong so easily. Proverbs 26, four through five is a great example of this. One of my favorite examples on how Proverbs works. 26 verse four, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you yourself will become like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. So is this a contradiction? Should we answer a fool or not? It depends on lots of things. The two lines in tension require us to think and to meditate and to gain wisdom, to work for it. 
when should I jump in and when should I stay out? When should I pile on the Facebook debate and when should I not? Usually not. When to wrestle the pig and when to uh, determine the pig is too muddy and I will get muddy too. Life-giving words are healing, helpful, and honest. The tongue is the power of life. But what else does the tongue have the power of? Death. Yep. Words can kill. Some words have literally triggered murder, suicide, actual wars. And words can kill psychologically. Call a child stupid or worthless, and it can impact their entire life. Words can murder reputation and relationships. Deadly words include all deceitful words. Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hates those it hurts. A flattering mouth works ruin. What's flattery? Flattery is something of a lying false compliment to kind of get something for yourself, to further my interest. And flattery works ruin because it's manipulation. And it, because it, and it because it gives someone else an unrealistic self-view. Proverbs, uh, Psalm 12.3, had to go to the Psalm for this one, but it shares how God feels about flattery. Ready for this? May the Lord cut off all flattering lips. What an image, huh? The tongue that makes great boasts. Proverbs 10.18, whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. See, lying is the language of the serpent. And yet, so often, we ourselves shade and twist and hide and downplay the truth, especially when it makes us look better. But lying, it fragments our reliability and it fragments our view of reality. Like toxic chemicals seeping into the ground, lying corrupts everything it touches. Then, of course, we're all too familiar with destructive words, in Proverbs, this includes perversity, reckless words, harsh words, gossip. And have you noticed that many of our biggest regrets, some of our worst wounds, are from these kinds of words? Things we've said or things said to us? Perverse words would be words that degrade or objectify others. Locker room talk. Proverbs 10, 32, the lips of the godly speak helpful words, but the mouth of the wicked speaks perverse words. Then there's reckless words. We read this one earlier, 1218. The words of the reckless pierce like swords. Another vivid image. Words get into our heart and into our soul. When you say something hurtful, that can't be undone. We can't take it back. It's like getting cut with a knife. Even if the wound heals, the scar probably remains. And digital communication is the worst for this because, you know, for reckless words, because it's instant, it's public, and it's permanent. And we see in our media and our politicians, on the right and the left, lots of reckless language. They traffic in it. And, and I don't know if you've noticed this recently, a lot of apocalyptic language. You guys know what that is? End of the world language? So we'll hear things like, if the other guy gets elected, it's the end of America. Vote like your life depends on it, because it does. Right? Come on, that's reckless. I can have serious concerns politically without using apocalyptic language. And campa campaigns have used this kind of language since Adams versus Jefferson in 1800. Okay. Another form of reckless language is sarcasm. I'm naturally a little more sarcastic and cynical. Anyone else have that spiritual gift? Oh, Larry, you wore the right shirt today. Sarcasm. Just the one service I offer? One more service I offer. Wow. Good timing. This sermon's for you, right? There's some, there's some benefit to sarcasm. It's, it's humorous. It's funny sometimes. But you know where the word sarcasm comes from? It means to tear flesh, to bitterly cut down. So I'm no genius, but if we have to put that word in one or the other category... In the building up or tearing down category, where do you think most of our sarcasm is going to go? Yeah. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. 
How many of us have learned this the hard way? I've been married a whole two and a half months. Thanks, Alan. And I've learned in this short amount of time that just because it's true doesn't mean it should be said or said uh, in a particular way, right? I'm just learning that, yep. I should have listened to you, Ron. More important than what we say is how we say it. We talked about earlier the importance of rebuke at times, but there's also a kind of person who's quick to debate, who's always criticizing, who seems to always be in some sort of argument. And I've been there. But it communicates a harshness. It stirs up, a, stirs up conflict. And as a side note, some of you speak incredibly harsh words to yourselves. You tear yourself down. I'm such an idiot. I can't do anything right. I'm worthless. I'm a loser. Not only is this harsh language, it's also lying language. Yes, you're flawed. We all are. Welcome to the club. But you're also valued and loved by God and by us. Last one here, I promise. Uh, Proverbs says a lot about gossip too. Uh-oh. Proverbs eleven thirteen: a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. There are ways to use the truth harmfully, to weaponize the truth, uh, betraying secret, secrets, using truth or partial truth to tear down a reputation. Even if gossip is true, it diminishes love for that person and increases pride in the gossiper. Proverbs 20, 19, a gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. My sister Natalie, in an amazing sermon a few years ago to our high school students, she was talking about gossip, and she shared really vulnerably how in high school, she uh, was gossiping with someone else via texting, you know, high school girl stuff, like, can you believe she said this? She's such a that, you know? And as she's texting, guess who she accidentally sent the text to? The main character of the storyline. Yeah. Whoops. Our words are powerful. I think many of us know this, even if we sometimes forget how powerful they are. But I think the biggest pill to swallow is where our words come from. The source of our words. See, most of the time we think the problem is outside of us. It's that other person's fault. They made me say it. If she didn't make me so angry, I wouldn't respond the way I did. Uh, just like Adam and Eve, passing the blame. But where does the Bible say our words come from? Proverbs 4, 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. For example, continue reading, verse 24, keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep your corrupt talk far from your lips. Now remember, the heart in scripture is not the thing that pumps blood, but the control center, the command center of my life. So everything I do flows not from someone else, flows not from you who made me angry, but flows from me, from my heart. Jesus says this explicitly, Matthew 12, 34, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Let that sink in. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So when I downplay my words by saying something like, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to say that. The truth of the matter is, a part of me did mean to say that. There's something inside of me that did mean that. Pastor Paul Tripp tells a story of going to a wild family reunion as a young boy. And there's lots and lots of alcohol flowing at this party. And his uncle gets slammed super drunk, and starts saying really degrading and sexually perverse things about women. And, um, you know, in front of little Paul and his brother. And so Paul's mom overhears this and grabs the brothers away from Drunkle Bill and, and just takes him to the car and they leave the party. And Paul's mother, recognizing a moment for teaching, turns to the brothers and says this, Paul and Mark, I want to say something to you and I want you never to forget it. There's nothing that comes out of the mouth of a drunk that wasn't there in the first place. 
There's nothing that comes out of the mouth of a drunk that wasn't there in the first place. James 4.1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So I'm the problem. My word problems are heart problems. So if corrupting words come from a corrupt heart, then the solution isn't washing my mouth out with soap. My mom tried it. It didn't work. If brown water is flowing out of my shower, the solution is not to change the shower head. Probably. I got to go to the source. And so here comes the renewal of our words. See, the renewal of our, of our words requires a renewal of the heart. So we need Jesus' transformation. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. In other words, just as God said, Let there be light to create the world, he also looks at our hearts and says, Let there be light, enlightening our darkened hearts. New creation. Acts 15, 8, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. See, the first step of heart transformation is recognizing that we're powerless to achieve it on our own. God purifies our hearts and gives us the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus, believing in Jesus. Have you trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, for a new heart? This is where our transformative faith journey with Jesus begins, but not where it ends either. See, after we become Christians, there's a long way to go, right? There's a lot of unlearning and heart training that has to happen. A lot of transformation and training and new creation ahead of us. 2 Corinthians 5.15, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for their, themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So every time I speak a harsh word, or words of flattery, or I shade the truth, or gossip, for example, I'm reverting back to old Tyler. You wouldn't have liked him. I'm living for myself again instead of for the one who died for me. But when I submit to the Spirit, when I trust God for heart transformation, then I'm empowered to speak like Jesus does. So the Spirit's training first involves self-control. That's learning when not to speak. We see this in Proverbs, of course. Proverbs 10, 19. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. Psalm 17, 27, the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. And whoever has understanding is even tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, discerning if they hold their tongues. But what does Paul contribute to this discussion? Who produces self-control? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that personal trainer of self-control. Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. The Holy Spirit produces this. Self-control then isn't just trying our best and biting our tongue. It's a constant conversation with the Spirit. Turning my impulses into intercession. Turning my frustration into conversation with God. So whenever someone makes me angry, or more accurately, draws out anger from me, that was already inside of me, that then becomes an opportunity to ask the Spirit what he's doing in my life and in that other person's life. Self-control also involves active listening. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but it's this idea that we have to truly understand our opponent's perspective and repeat it back to them to their satisfaction before arguing with them or sharing our own perspective. Proverbs 18, 13, to answer before listening, that's folly and shame. And James 1.19, classic, right? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Proverbs, uh, Psalm 141.3, what a great prayer to pray. God set a guard over my mouth. Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. So the Spirit teaches us self-control, listening, when not to speak. But the Spirit also teaches us when to speak, 
The Spirit trains us how to talk. The Spirit teaches us a new language. The speech of the Spirit. Remember our text for the, today. The tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. That word fruit caught my eye. Uh, I love all the fruit trees this time of year. I pulled this peach off the one in the back. I don't know if you planted that one, Doc, uh, but th this one's in the back, not quite ripe. But I love these fruit trees. And good words are like good fruit, naturally coming out of our lives. Where else do we read about fruit in the Bible? Yeah, back to the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is, and let's put this in the lens of language, the fruit of the Spirit is words of love, words of joy, words of peace and patience, kind words, good words, faithful words, gentle words, the language of the Spirit. And these things come out of a right heart. You can only fake these words for so long, but genuine words really stand out. For example, what about joyful words, words of joy in a time of a lot of negativity, a lot of battle language. You guys hearing a lot of battle language? We've got to fight for this and our rights. What about words of joy? It's so contagious. Now, words of laughter and humor and fun. Jason, you're a person of joy. Right? Joyful words, they stand out. They're refreshing. Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you might know how to answer everyone. Words is good seasoning. Good seasoning. Uh, with that flavor permeating everything. Who's getting hungry? I'm going to invite the worship team back up. But I want to leave us with this thought. How do you learn a new language? How many of you have tried to learn a second language? A few of us. There's this joke in other countries. It's, uh, what do you call someone who only knows one language? An American. Yeah. So if you try to learn a language, it's difficult, but it's also very rewarding. How do you successfully learn another language? In short, you immerse yourself in it. Uh, you listen a lot and you converse a lot. You have to listen a lot. You have to get an ear for the language. I spent some time in Mexico and you just listening all day gives you a huge headache because of all the listening you're doing. And you listen to music. So you listen a lot and you talk a lot. You converse and practice a lot. You make lots of mistakes. I said so many cuss words on accident in Spanish. <laughs> and a few on purpose. And they say you're basically fluent in a foreign language when you start dreaming in it. When you start dreaming. Yeah. The second language rewires your brain in significant ways. And you know where I'm going with this. Are we fluent in the speech of the Spirit? Do we immerse ourselves in His words? Do we listen a lot to Him and to others fluent in the language of the Spirit? As we argued earlier, our heart changes our words, but I think the reverse is also true for us as Christians. It's cyclical. Words of the Spirit change our heart. It's just as a second language rewires the brain, so the speech of the Spirit rewires our heart. When I don't feel like encouraging someone, but I do it anyway, that changes my heart. When I don't feel like praying, when I don't feel like singing, when I don't feel like saying that peaceful word, but I do it anyway, that produces the feeling that I didn't quite have. There's something about putting actual words to our deeply felt convictions that makes them more real. The tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. So as I extend the fruit of the Spirit, maybe words of love or joy to you or to someone else, then I'm going to actually get to enjoy it myself. I could kind of take a bite out of it as I hand it to you and enjoy it and enjoy the life that comes from it, to feel the power of the life that comes from it. The tongue is the power of life and death and those who love it will eat of its fruits. So from a purified heart, we start to speak the words, the new words of the Spirit, like babies. As we practice and listen a lot, our hearts mature. As our hearts mature, so does our vocabulary, our tone and our temper. So does our, our, our word count changes. It goes down. 
our posture changes. And we'll find that even in our solitude and sleep, that our dreams will change to reflect God's priorities. The tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruits. Let's pray. God, I pray that we would be people who speak the language of the Spirit, Lord, that we would be people just so characterized by the fruits of the Spirit in our words. Lord, if there are those who haven't experienced the transformation that only Jesus can bring in our hearts, I pray that for them this morning. And for those of us who have, Lord, continue to teach us to speak your words, to be people who speak life and not death. Lord, help us to be a refreshing countercultural voice in the midst of so much polarization and negativity. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus.